Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric, the makers of the K-Box and the new K-Pulley. Guys, flywheel training's really grown in popularity of late, and although it's something that's been around for a while, the simple reason that it's grown in popularity is because it works. We've been lucky to have a K-Box in our weight room for the past three years, and we've seen some really great things when it comes to improving the athlete's ability to change direction, and then looking at our return to play protocols with different lower body injuries with the student athletes. The love-hate relationship that everyone has with the K-Box is now just going to grow more with the addition of the K-Pulley. The ability to do standing presses, pulls, rip-throughs, and knee drive exercises is just going to be another arsenal to our training and another addition to the love-hate relationship that our student-athletes have with the awesome tools that come from Eccentric. Go ahead and hop over to Eccentric.com today to check out what they have. Guys, I can't recommend it enough, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed not just with the products, but with the awesome customer service that Eccentric provides. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content it provides, be sure to hop over and check out the community. The community is an exclusive members website that is just an extension of what we do here in July at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar. What it is is a combination of video lectures, a coach's corner with your Monday morning take-home information, and a forum where you can talk about anything and everything related to the field of strength and conditioning. In the community, you'll find content added each month from some of the top practitioners in the world, ranging from PhDs to high-level coaches, bringing you exactly what they're doing with their athletes or their research at the present moment. On top of that, an additional discussion by coaches bringing you that Monday morning information, things that you can add to your training program right away. Tying that in with the opportunity to discuss with coaches around the world in the forum on anything and everything from the topics addressed in these presentations to whatever you're seeing in your daily life as a coach. If this sounds like the right thing for you and your staff, go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and try it out for 48 hours for just a dollar. If you like it, you're signed up, ready to roll, and you're jumping into all the great content added each month. If not, feel free to go ahead and cancel at any time. No questions asked. We're really excited about what we're building in the community and hope you are too. Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we are going to discuss the commonalities of some of the great coaches in athletics and all things Bondarchuk with Derek Evely. Uh, after a quick intro, Derek's going to get right into discussing the coaches that he's learned from and the commonalities that he has seen within them. Uh, it's really an awesome kind of behind-the-looking-glass look from one of the top coaches in athletics, from the people that have impacted him. This is really, really cool. Uh, then we get into talking about Dr. B and programming and, and where people misinterpret what Dr. Bondarchuk has been doing and saying and how he, he really works with his athletes and a lot of the problems that a lot of coaches have with it. We finish off talking about a course that Dr. B and Derek put together and it's an absolutely sensational product that I can't recommend enough. But uh, guys, this really is an awesome talk. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Derek, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Hey, it's great to it's great to be here. I've uh, heard a lot of good things about you, and uh, I've been wanting to do this for a while, so it's 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 good. I'm glad. Yeah, man, I'm really excited for this. This has been one that I've had on the radar for a long time. So, for for the you know person and a half maybe that's sitting here listening that doesn't know who you are, let's give them the quick intro rundown of of how you got where you are and what you're doing right now. Sure. Yeah. I, I have a really sort of unique, bizarre little position within this world of, uh, you know, that's this big world that's growing online of, uh, I guess, experts, quote unquote, so to speak. And that, you know, I, uh, I have this, uh, I'm sort of the de facto bonder Chuck expert because I hired him, uh, 12, 12 or 13 years ago to, uh, you know, to move to Canada, he was sort of, um, uh, he was off in obscurity in, um, in the Middle East and wanted to, wanted to emigrate to North America. And it's, it's a long story, but, uh, you know, essentially he ended up in my basement. Um, and I hired him as my, 
you know, uh, as one of my assistant coaches actually for a small club here. And then, uh, and, and I was the head coach of that club. And then I, I left about a year later or le- a little less than that. Um, and I went on to be the sports science manager at the Canadian athletics coaching center, which was basically like a coaching think tank, uh, that was set up from the legacy of the 2001 world championships. And I was there for four years. And then I went to Britain for four years and worked there as a, I was a center director um, for UK Athletics, who had set up two different Olympic training centers going into the 2012 Games. They had more more money than God to for all of that. So they had set up two centers, one in London uh, that service the London athletes. And my friend and colleague, good friend and colleague, Dan Paff, was the center director for that one. And I was the center director for the other one, which serviced everybody outside of London, everyone else in the UK. And so... And then after that, um, I, it wasn't really feasible to stay in the UK, although I kind of wanted to in, in, a, in a few ways. But I uh, moved back to Canada and I've been back here for the last, God, what has it been now? Six years now, almost, almost six or five, five, five and a half years. And uh, so now I've been consulting. I do a lot of uh, um, coach development work, mostly outside of where I live and I've just started this website now eviltracksport.com to try to you know uh rather than travel so much do a little bit more work that way and the first thing I've done is start this bonder track course so I'm it's I've kind of come back full circle and I'm spending uh you know I'm back I'm back connected with Dr. B just lives up the road from me and uh yeah so that's you know I I also had a you know I've been a real student of of theory and methodology and sport training for ever since I started coaching well before I met Dr. B. So it's kind of a weird thing that he would, you know, that he, we, we got connected. And so, um, yeah. So anyways, that's in a nutshell, that's my background. Oh, and and, well, I, and I'm a track and field coach. So, I mean, I've, I've been on, you know, I've, I've, I've coached all the events in athletics. I've been on, I think, six or seven world champs teams world junior champs world champs for two different for britain and canada uh been i've been named to two olympic teams went to one olympics not the other one i resigned um in protest and (laughs) it's a little bit of my history as well but anyways um you know i i've been staffed coaches and had athletes compete at european champs world champs olympics on and on and on so i love that that's kind of my, you know, now I have sort of in the last 10 years since meeting Dr. B, I've really sort of focused in on the throws and in particular the hammer throw. So let's, let's kind of talk about two of those people there. And obviously, you know, you are the, the bonder true guy. So obviously learning from a guy that one of them, one of them, right. yeah, there's me and there's, and there's Martin Bingisser as well. So, yeah. and then the a, a kid, Jake Jensen and Dr. B are pretty tight too. And I would put him on that list as well. Yeah. Um, but you've learned from, you know, one that people would argue was the greatest coach in the history of the Olympics with Anatoly. And then one that people might say is the best coach around right now in athletics and Dan Paff. Are you seeing any similarities? Cause I, we were lucky to spend a few days with Dan here uh, at the last seminar, and I've gotten the chance to talk with Dr. B quite a few times. Like, what similarities do you see from people like that that are up at the top, like the people that are up at the top of the game when it comes to things like that? Um, in general or specifically about methodology or both? Yes, both of them. Yeah, there's, there's a lot. You know, it's pretty interesting. I also studied under Charlie Francis for a while. And, uh, um, name people might know. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, well, I wouldn't say I didn't formally study under him, but, um, when I was a younger coach, I got to know Charlie and spent a little bit of time with him. He was very gracious with me. Um, I would, you know, whenever I rolled through Toronto, I would, I would a couple of times I would, I was able to sit down with him and communicate with him and show him my, what I was doing. And he was, you know, really helpful. Uh, his, speed training book the first version of that was really had a huge impact on me so um but yeah but my two big mentors are dr b and and dan um i would say and um yeah in terms of similarities you know uh i would say well the the one thing that 
first jumps out is that both of them are very much, you know, they have a system down. They don't really, they don't fuck with it. They don't, they don't, you know, it is what it is. It, it, it evolves and it has evolved throughout their career, but essentially, you know, they've, they've, um, you know, they've gotten into a groove where they know what, what works for them. Um, you got to remember Dr. B is probably, you know, uh, one generation even older than, than Dan. So, but the two of them came and myself came through, uh, you know, when we were developing as coaches, uh, you know, there was no internet, right. And so, you know, they, they, you know, that's you, you, you put together your system based on information that was much harder to get. And, uh, you, you couldn't just go out there and, and, and see everything that there is in one evening sitting down at your computer. You had to travel, you had to talk to people, you had to, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that, and that's pretty significant because one of the things I see these days is there is so much out there, so much that, you know, and I'm contributing to it is that, you know, a lot of the younger coaches I see coming up, you know, they're changing what they're doing. They're, you know, they, it, it's almost information overload. There's, they don't know what is good and what isn't. And there's, there's just so much coming at them. I, I actually don't know how they do it sometimes. So I think that's number one. Um, in terms of methodology, it's quite interesting. There's two things there. One is that, um, if you look at Dan's methodology, so if you, and Dan doesn't really, it's not so much he has a system that he'll, he can sit out there, stand out there and explain to you the way Dr. B, the way I can with Dr. B's system. Okay. But he, you know, one, uh, one exercise I did for a presentation in Britain is I took all of Dan's famous micros. Okay. So in other words, he has He's written all of his different workouts and his micros for sprinters, jumpers, throwers, whatever. And they are what they are. They don't really, they, don't, they haven't really changed in 20, 30 years. And they are in one month blocks. Okay. So, you know, you, you have a sheet, it's, it's the weekly micro and at the bottom, it'll tell you what to, you know, how to adapt it for week one, week two, week three, that kind of thing. I sat down once and I, and I, I wrote all that out on an annual plan, went through all the volumes, went through all the exercise changes. And it's actually quite similar to what Bonderchuk does. He does not change things for a certain period. Uh, and then when it changes, it all changes. OK, so that's quite interesting. Um, I mean, there's big differences there between that and what Bonderchuk. Bonderchuk takes it to another level. It's all it's all designed around the athlete's individual response to, you know, there's no time limit at the end. You, you don't stop with a set of programs or what we call a PDSF period of development, of sport form. You don't stop until the athlete reaches peak condition, but it, it is people use the term block. It's not a great, it doesn't really describe what Bonner truck does, but for lack of a better term, you know, that's Dan's is quite similar to that. The other thing I would say is the whole, and this is where Charlie comes in, this whole thing of the polarization of training, whereas there's that middle ground of intensity that is, um, you know, uh, more, you know, intensive enough that you can't use it as a recovery or general training, um, but not intensive enough to to be highly specific and it has a huge uh physical impact on the athlete um they really you know they kind of shy away from that type of work or at least if they do it they manage it in a way that it doesn't exist in at, at the in the same cycles as the very high end very specific training bonner chuck's very much into that now that's not necessarily a not necessarily a philosophy in his head the way that well I guess it is but the way that it was sort of in Charlie's head but the end result is very very similar if you look at Barnachuk cycles they are uh, you know everything is either really specific or it's very general and even in the middle ground there with the what we call the SPE the specific preparation exercises um, a lot of that it, you know he just dials that right down. 
I don't necessarily do that. I think in, at, there are times when that becomes an issue with with his training. Um, but generally speaking, he's very similar to, to, to Charlie's approach in that way. And of course, the whole vertical integration thing, that's another similarity uh, or co- what Bondarchuk calls complex methodology. Dan's the same. Charlie's the same. Bondarchuk's the same. Um, they are doing specific work day one. Like if back to the example with Dan, when I wrote all that out, those his sprinters, they are doing short sprints week one uh, of an annual plan. There is no, you know, huge general phase where they're run, out running miles and miles and stuff like that. A lot of non-specific training. Bonner Chuck, when they start week, you know, well, the, he doesn't really do annual. It doesn't look at it in terms of an annual plan. But if you were to look at it when he starts in the fall, Day one throwing. Uh, Charlie's the same with this, with, you know. So I, I think those are the big similarities. Yeah, and I think that what the, the three things that are really that, that show up there is that it's it, it's got to be specific or general or it's got to be fast or slow, not that middle ground with all three of them. Right. They, uh, the, the middle ground can't exist in the same at the same time as the other two well it can it, it can exist with general but but not with the highly specific stuff because it 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 taps into those specific resources too much and it takes away from it i think that that's something too though that a lot of people get confused and i think especially strength coaches when it comes to like the conditioning aspect could you dive down that rabbit hole a little bit and explain what that middle ground is? Because I, I do, I think that that's one thing because people like strength coaches in particular love to talk about Charlie Francis, mm. but I think a lot of strength coaches are like, they don't just put their toe in the water in the middle. I think they're diving in and they're swimming laps in it. Yeah, I think, well, look at it this way. It's like, you know, when you, when let's, okay, let's call it lifting. Okay. So if you're doing weight room exercises and you are implementing that within a, an overall program that an athlete is doing, um, you know, a lot of intensive specific speed work, let's say it's a, a sprinter, then you need to make sure that those loads are number one, you know, they, they don't need to be so, so much, so, spe- well, when we talk about specific, what's specific? What is specific lifting to a sprinter, right? Well, it should be within that, within the within the speed power realm. So however you see that. So for me, I typically would never go above, um, you know, if we're talking about repetitions, five, six repetitions, I would move everything ballistically as much as possible. Um, I And I would be very careful about how much I went into the max strength zone. Not that I wouldn't do it. Bondarchuk doesn't do it, even with throwers. I do to some degree. But you want to keep it so that, you know, to me, I would call anything within that envelope specific. So number one is you want to stay in that zone, obviously. And number two, you got to be rational with the loads and the implementation of the loads so that it doesn't detract from what they're doing on the track. Unless there's a specific reason to like, unless the, and that would be driven by the track coach that, you know, maybe they feel like there needs to be some more of that kind of work. Then you would set out a plan that would maybe even if, you know, the lifting and the sprinting would exist in the same cycle, but, um, but, you know, there might be an emphasis on the, on the, on the max strength or something like that. But even still, you still have to be rational with those loads that they don't negatively impact what the athlete is doing on the track. So, for instance, you know, in Charlie's, you know, in Charlie's mind, it was all about the nervous system. If you're tapping in and you are depleting those, those, those resources, those neural resources, then there's going to be nothing left on the track. So the athlete is either going to get hurt or they're going to not be able to perform that type of specific activity, the sprinting, uh, in, in a manner that is, uh, you know, that is going to transfer or they're, you know, they're just not even going to be able to do it because they can't, they're, they're, they're drained. Okay. So that, and that's, you know, and Bonderchuk is kind of the same 
although in his mind, it's just it's not really about detracting from those specific resources which would be throwing. It's more about it just doesn't to him. It just doesn't transfer. It's just pointless. OK. Once an athlete is above the actual threshold that's necessary to, to throw. So there is a threshold that we know. Nobody knows exactly what it is, but there is, you know, there is a, a basic threshold for athletes at specific levels of throwing. You need a certain amount of maximal strength. Um, but once you're above that, it's, you know, there's no point in trying to develop that, overdevelop that anymore. You, you need to worry about specific exercises and throwing. Does that, does that all make sense? Did no, I answer 100%. Your Especially okay. with Dr. B's because he's just going to keep doing what he's doing until it stops getting them better and then he's going to change it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, so, so that's, well, that comes into the, the other thing, which is really, really, now this is unique to Dr. B, although I've seen it in Dan's methodology as well. I don't know if Dan, you know, if you were to sit down and talk to him, have this conversation with him, he would probably say, yeah, that's why I do that. But I've never actually had that conversation with him. So one of the things, one of the things that is very unique to Dr. B's system is this idea that he doesn't wave load volume and intensity. So he doesn't use changes in, in, uh, in loading, uh, whether that be volume or intensity, it, you know, those intensity is what it is. It's always high volume is what it is. It's, it's, it's whatever you can get away with at that intensity. So he, it, that's always very consistent. Um, and in fact, when he's, when he actually issues programs, it, it, when you really look at it, it's, it's, I mean, it does not change from day to day. Okay. Well, I'm not talking about, he doesn't even allow little changes. Um, but it's, you know, like when we're talking about, he, he uses in order to draw, you know, you know, classically, that's what strength and conditioning people and speed power coaches use and endurance, I guess, use to drive adaptation. It's those changes of all change of, the, of those two elements and how you cycle them and that. That's how you get an athlete better. Dr. B doesn't do that. He uses a change in exercise set. So those two elements are kept constant. And when an athlete reaches peak condition, I guess I should do it this way. <laughs> when an athlete reaches peak condition, um, then rather than say, okay, now we're going to unload or we're going to load, load more, we're going to load differently. It, that He doesn't do that. He just changes the pattern of what they're doing, the exercises or the exercise set. 100%. And I love it because it's like... That's very unique. Yeah. Well, but if you just take a step back, right, and you think about it, it's like if you're getting better by doing this and that's all that you need to keep getting better, we just do X, then why do you need to add Y? Mm -hmm. Like just do what you need to do to get better and then go home. Yeah, but there comes a point where, it, well, that's exactly it. So, like you, you, we will present a program to it to a thrower, or two programs or three programs. I usually don't go above three. Doctor B almost always uses just one. I use two or three. He uses one or two most of the time. I use two or three most of the time. But that's a different discussion. But anyways, and a program is a workout. That's all it is, right? It's a workout. So you present these two or three workouts and they just roll along and roll along and they don't change. And think about that for a second. You're giving the exact same stimulus day in and day out, okay? It does. So let's say the athlete peaked in six weeks, okay? At, we're tracking measurables. So for us, that means we're, we're measuring throwing distance. And I use a lot of secondary measurables like bar velocity and stuff like that. So I track them all. So let's just for argument's sake, say it took the athlete six weeks to peak the workout that you did at the, at the end of that six weeks, the day before you peak is the exact same workout you did at the beginning. Now that's not normal. That's not what people would normally do. So, and you know, so, but the, 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 the big, the problem is, and, and that athlete has peaked if you don't change, if you keep it similar, then they will start to lose form. 
So it's, it's, you know, the athlete, it's I, I, the analogy that I've come up with, it's like Chinese water torture, right? Um, you know, it's like drop, drop, drop. I have a huge video in the, in the, in the Bonner Trek course on, on this and, uh, where I, I go, I walk you th right through that entire thing. And, you know, it's like Chinese water trip when, you know, initially the drops don't feel too bad, right? They feel pretty good and, and everything's going really well. And then, but there comes a point where it's an irritation, right? And it's at that point that you have to change and you have to use a different drop after that. Otherwise it, the system starts to decline. And that is the problem. That is what people, I mean, if you, if you buy into all of this with the Bonnerchuk methodology, then you come to realize that that is where a lot of people run into problems because they get to a point where, yeah, what they did worked really well and they had a great system and they, even if they're wave loading volume and intensity, they get to a point and the athlete's doing really well. And then they don't, they just, I mean, it's natural, right? Like don't, change what isn't broken or don't try to fix what's not broken right and so they think well it's worked up to this point should keep working well one thing you realize when you implement the bonner check system and you strictly control all of these things is that no they will if you don't make a change at that point then um then then they will not continue and we see this in our sport all the time and it classically manifests itself as really big early season performances so if you look at a no it doesn't happen to everybody but it's very common in that athletes will come out in april may during the early season have huge performances right they've been training since the fall and um and they have huge performances and oh yeah everything's great well we're just going to keep doing what we're doing and use the same exercises and use the same low uh, uh patterns of loading uh, the same tape or whatever. And then when the major champs come up two, three months down the road, they, they, they don't rise above it. If at best they may maintain it. And so, you know, and that's to me, having done this system, I I've learned that that's in my opinion, due to the fact that they didn't change anything. Okay. Now it's all uh, of course related to what you did beforehand as well. You know, I mean, if, you know, if you have all of this constant change, even with exercise sets, then it's, 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 you know, that takes a long time to peak. And that's one of the reasons why it takes those athletes that do that in that example, they don't peak until April because that's how long it takes them to peak with all of this change. Whereas in the Bonner truck system, we've, you learn that if you don't have all of that consistent chaotic change within a given cycle, the athlete will peak a lot sooner that means you're going to be able to have more peaks in a given season than um, than athletes. It, it all depends on the sport you're in too, right? Um, but even one extra peak a year over the course of an athlete's career can lead to like, it can add up to, in that sense, you know, an extra few years of training. So, and I have a video in the course, I go through all of that and I, for sprinters, I mean, if you can do one extra specific session every two weeks, I forget what the numbers work out to, but I think over an athlete's career, it, it adds up to two extra years of specific training, one extra workout every two weeks. Okay. But people get, people get into these traditional setups and traditional loads sprinters you can't go more than three times a week well yeah you can't but why you know maybe you could you know like i don't think anybody can any sprinter that's especially if they're if they're not on drugs i don't think any sprinter can do five specific sessions a week but you might be able to get seven every two weeks you might you know so why not try it and then, of course, that backs up into micro design, because that if you're going to do that, then you're going to have to go off of a, a, a standard seven day micro. And again, I, I walked everybody through that in the course, but it's just something to think about. So when you start getting into this Bonner truck system, you start to it really opens your eyes to to a lot of things. And that's why I tell people you don't you don't have to do Bonner truck to learn some really important, interesting concepts that you may not have learned in other places. It's just, he just throws 
turns a lot of shit right on its head. Um, and it's been really fascinating to me. It's opened my eyes to a lot of things. You know, a lot of the best athletic coaches in the world, though, do that. You know, like, I'm really close with Hank Krajinhoff and, uh, yeah, and I know Hank. Yeah. Like if, if you want to talk about somebody who flips conventional theory on its head, I mean, that's a long way to drop it on its head from way up there with Hank. But, uh, yeah, he's an out of the box thinker big time. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Gotta be out there in the Netherlands, though. Yeah, totally. Well, hey, I'll give you an example of that. And I've used this in a lot of presentations, you know, and I talk and I talk about this in the course. Apologies for keep coming back to the course. Not that I'm trying to sell it or anything. It's just that a lot of these ideas, you know, I talk about in the course. So one thing I heard him say once, or I don't know whether it was in a lecture or him and I were talking or whatever. I inter- Oh, I know what it was. It's when I interviewed him way back, like 10 years ago. Uh, for the CACC site, he was talking about Troy Douglas, the 200 meter sprinter that he had. And he was talking about using the Omega wave and he could not get, he could not ever get um, Troy to fully recover between sessions using, you know, a standard sprint setup. He was trying all these different micro setups and, and all this different thing, all these different things and using the Omega wave, which if you don't know is a, it's a very sophisticated tool for measuring an athlete's adaptability and whether they're ready for the next, you know, next high intensity training system. It measures brain waves and all these things. Um, and he just thought, well, I'm going to give him two days off, which is not something that we normally do in, in athletics. It's just it's just not part of our thinking. And the moment he gave him two days off, boom, he got he you know, the, he was recovering. And so, you know, I bring this up in the course and when I'm talking about micro setups, you need to, you need to think outside the box and, you know, and there's nothing wrong with having two days off. I'm coaching an athlete right now that I do it with, you know, it's like, take the weekend off, (laughs) you know, it's not going to hurt you. And, and you may find that it's, uh, you know, you may find that it's actually beneficial and you may recover better. So, you know, the, the, the message is not that two days off is what people need. The message is you have to experiment with these different things and not be afraid to, you know, to, to, to go outside within reason, especially when you're talking about loading within reason, you need to be able to think outside the box and, and, um, you know, do and do what you got to do. No, I love it. Yeah. Hank is, uh, Hank, Hank, I think the, you know, I mean, everybody knows Hank's famous, Give them what they need, not what they can handle. But I think that Hank's best line that I've ever heard him say is, most coaches would rather outwork the competition than win. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, you know, and that comes – well, and that comes back to, you know, when we talked about the beginning, the the, the similarities between, you know, the great ones is they, you know, they they train smart, right? They, they train very smart. Um, another thing I would, I wouldn't say this is completely unique to Dr. B, but he takes it to a level that is, you know, almost unheard of. And that's this idea of smaller doses more often. Okay. So in, you know, and in particular with throws. Okay. So, and this is where a lot of the confusion gets, you know, people get confused. A, a lot of the confusion around the Bonner truck system exists. So he, you know, when he moved to North America and moved, like I said, moved into my basement, we started coaching together. The first thing he did was these throwers take them. I had them training tr- on a traditional uh, North American setup, maybe three throwing three, four times a week. You know, maybe now I don't think I ever went to five, but we were doing some, we were doing specific work every day. So, but he's got them throwing 10 times a week, like twice a day, every day, right? But they're very small doses. So they're very intensive, high quality, small doses. And the thing, and it works really well. Like in, you can do it in throws. And then of course, everybody was thinking, you know, and Dr. B does some crazy shit sometimes and he's tried it with high jumpers and it's just stupid and just didn't work. And he's, and you can't do that with javelin throwers. I don't care who you are. You just, you just cannot do it. But it's the concept. And again, it goes back to what I was talking about, about challenging your beliefs and how you how you set up your micros. If you can get, you know, in that extra sprint session every two weeks, it can pay long term dividends. Okay, you might get an extra peak, one extra peak 
every year, right? In throws, it's just it's just the nature of the heavy throws is you're able to condense it all because they can handle it. Depend, de, you know, uh, despite what a lot of people think, I've done it for years. It it works really well. But you got to have the loads. The loads have got to be rational. They've got each workout is only an hour, hour and fifteen minutes long. It's not long, everything, and they lift well, maybe an hour and a half, and. It, but, you know, they they warm up, throw, special exercises, lift, general, all of that in that hour and a half. But it's it's very intensive, very quick. And then they get out, they go rest and they come back and do it again. You know, it's it's, uh, you know, similar to the whole Bulgarian revolution in weightlifting that that came along, what, 20, 30 years ago, where people went and started studying, you know, once a wall fell, they were studying that and they were, I mean, these, these fuckers are lifting five times a day, right? It's the same thing. You can do it, but it's got to be, um, uh, you know, it has to be in a sport where the body can tolerate it, number one. And, you know, it has to be done rationally, right? You can't do it in sprints. It, 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 you know, you cannot sprint 10 times a week, right? You might be able to do, depending on how you break it up, you might be able to do it five, maybe, if you really got crazy with the, with the micros and you were really careful. But I, I'm thinking, you know, probably four is probably the max. So, But in throws, you in heavy throws, you, you can do it 10. I've got a javelin guy I'm working with now. We're experimenting with that and i have them on a three-day micro all the time i you know just seven day micro just i just can't make it work with that doing the bonner check system well i could but it's it's just he has a lot of flexibility in schedule so we go with a three-day micro he's got three workouts two of them are very split one's throwing one's throwing balls and he's able to do it you know so it's not throwing javelin eight times a week but it's throwing something eight times a week so and it's working very well that's awesome. That's that's killer. I love how that all ties back together. And then let's get out of here on this, man. You've talked about it a few times. Let's talk about the course. What what do you got going? How did it come about? And because uh, I think the story about how it came about is really awesome. And, mm. uh, and and you know what is what is something that people can expect from it? Because you you've brought a lot of things up that are conventional misnomers about dr b so let's let's run that okay so i've been wanting to do this for a very long time so it's, it's essentially dr b and i when he <laughs> the first day that he moved into my basement i've told the story a lot so uh but so i'll i'll keep it brief but the first day was uh, april 1st uh, 2005, I, we had a big fundraiser for our track club here, which we had done for seven years up to that point where we were selling manure. We sold manure, bags of manure and delivered it, which everybody kind of laughs about until they, you know, find out I'd made $53,000 in a weekend selling manure. Um, that, and so it was a big, 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 big production. We, and the, just the way everything worked out, he, uh, he landed on that day with his brother-in-law. I was running around in this manure truck, you know, covered in shit and over my coveralls, ran to the airport, picked him up, drove him home, drove him to my house. I said, I, I got to leave. I'm in the middle of this big thing. I got to get up to the track and, and organ and, you know, lead everything. I said, here's your, here's your apartment. I renovated my apartment in my basement. I'll be back tonight. See ya. So I leave. And I come home at like 10 o'clock at night and uh, I go in to check on and make sure everything's OK. And freaking I knock on the door and the door, you know, and I'd only met him once before this. I'd, I'd gone to uh, Hungary to see him do a, the first clinic he'd done in 10 years. Uh, he kind of came out of hiding from the Middle East. And so, you know, I didn't know him. Like I didn't really know him at all. And so he a door flies open and he comes barreling out and. At this point, he was in his 60s, early 60s, and he's like, Daddy, 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 come, 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 we, we write book, 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 like this, right? And I'm like, Fuck. I'm like it's 10 o'clock, man, I don't want to go to bed. So we were up till 2 a.m., and he had written these pages of handwritten Russian um, of what he wanted to write in this book, and then took an English-Russian dictionary and trans each, translated each word, word for word, and said, here, write book, and handed it to me, right? And I'm like, you know, put it on computer. And I'm like, and I'd set up an office in that basement. And I'm like, well, first of all, this is gobbledygook. Like, anybody who knows that, and that's just no way that's going to work. There was no there was no internet translators or anything like that then, right? 
So we sat down and for the next six months that we went through this process where we would get up in the morning and uh, go coach the first session, come home for three hours, hole up in the basement and write this book. And so we, we, you know, and that's how I learned the system and that's the start of it for me. So that really became like, I mean, no one has gotten that kind of an education out of him. It was just the way it worked. I was just very, very fortunate. So, but we got frustrated doing that. And because he's hard headed and I'm hard headed, it just became three hour shouting matches at each other because I would say the, you know, he thought I was an idiot, right? He didn't know who I was. I was some podunk coach in this, in this small Canadian town that, you know, and here's the great, one of the greatest minds in sports science ever to come down the pipe. He's moved into my basement. He thinks I don't know shit. But in reality, I was actually well educated on a lot of these things. And I'd studied for Shansky and Bonnerchuk and, you know, all this. So, so I, I would get an idea for what he wanted to say. And I would say, no, you, but the English, I mean, he couldn't speak a word of English. He could say hello and a few things. That's it. So I would say, no, this is what you want to say. Oh my God, it was horrible. So anyways, we, but I wrote all the charts for him and stuff. So anyways, we did that. And then uh, we, I said, finally, after six chapters, I said, nope, that's enough. So he went out over the next few years. And then I left Kamloops and he went out over the next few years and was, you know, had some really poor translations done of his work. Uh, the yeses stuff is a bit of an exception there and the stuff Jake does. But I've talked to Jake and, you know, and he's frustrating to work with because uh, it's just his writing style is very, very odd. And that anyways, so. Over the next 10 years, it's like nobody – oh, and that book never saw the light of day, okay? So I buried it, never looked at it. I didn't look at it for years and years. I went off and did my thing in Edmonton and UK, and I and then, you know, this problem started to creep up with all of his translations, and even though he is writing all this shit about his method, and it's all good stuff if you can understand it, if you can understand it, He's not explaining anything to anybody. And so everybody starts coming to me and everybody starts, you know, I'm getting the guys emailing me from all over the world, want to know how to do Bonner Chuck and Martin's kind of going through the same thing. And, and I thought, fuck it, I'm, I'm going to do a course. I'm going to do an online course. And I didn't even talk to him about it. I just went ahead and did it. And I started that about a year ago and I'm going to, but the purpose of the course is to, practically show you how this is done and use the book I wrote with them, which is a synopsis of sort of all of the books that he's come out with. So like it's a chapter on training, transfer training, a chapter on periodization, a chapter on methods, a chapter on peculiarities. And so we, I, these are all different videos in the courses where I sit down and give my thoughts, explain, and then I do a, a graphic video on how to walk everyone through it. And where, you know, it'd been, you know, the some of the deepest, darkest parts of it that I never used because they, they wouldn't be appropriate to athletics. I went and sat down with Dr. B and walked through it. And, and there it is. It's up. And so that's kind of how it how it came about. And I think, you know, I'm quite proud of it. it I, I think it we, we did a good job. Or I did a good job on um, on putting that together. And I actually learned a couple of things. There's a couple of key parts to it that never quite, I mean, I've always been able to make the Bonnerchuk system work and it's worked very well for me. But there's a few key parts that, especially around uh, form loss and these three different reactions that are very famous of the system, a couple things that never quite made sense to me. I, could, I knew how to make it work, but I couldn't explain it because I'd always get to a point where there would be a contradiction. Well, now I figured that out because I that one in particular and I went over to his place one day and I said, I'm not fucking leaving here until we sort this out. Right. And it didn't work. So I went back and thought about it for this was like a couple months ago and I went back over again. I'm sitting down and finally I got it. I finally got it out of him. And it's not because he doesn't want to give it to you. It's be, it's just because the 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 issue of uh, communication. And when I got this one piece of information, which is in the thing, all of it, it was the final piece. It was the linchpin of the whole thing. I was like, oh, okay, now I know how to explain this part. And so 
that's in the peculiarities section. And it, it, it just, it's not a huge piece of, well, it is a huge piece of information, but it's very simple. And I was just, you know, just the way he had explained the nature of those three reactions to us in the past. What well, it's not that it was wrong, but there was another piece of information that if you don't know, and it relates to form loss. Um, and you know, that puts it all together uh, and makes it all make sense. So, so, you know, it, it, it was actually quite wild and I, you have access to the course, so I'm not going to tell you what it is. You, you, it's in peculiarities of sport form number two. And I talked about it. You, you'll be interested. You'll be, if, if you've been, if you're a student of Bonner check stuff, you'll go, Oh shit. Now it all makes sense. So I love it. I love it. So where can they find out more and how can they get involved in it? It's at eviltracksport.com. There's you go on there. There's a there's two. Uh, I'm going to be putting up more courses coming up. I just uh, I've got a lot of stuff. You can see the way I'm dressed. I'm I'm laying concrete in my backyard. I'm doing a lot of home rental stuff right now. But uh, I'm going to have that done in a couple of weeks. And I'm going to get back to putting up some more courses. Eviltracksport.com. There's two. There's there's one course up. The Bonner Check course. You, it's obvious. You'll see the link. Um, then. Um, um, there is another link there for a, for a conference I'm holding in Vancouver in the third weekend, I think of October, Dr. B will be there. Him and I will be presenting together. Uh, Dan Paff is going to be there. PJ Vazel. If you don't know PJ, one of the most brilliant minds in sprints, he's probably the upcoming Hank Cranghoff, I would call him. Uh, and Charlie, you know, I mean, he's that kind of mind. He's quite and Dan, you know, he's, he's, you know, but he's, he's in his thirties. Great guy. Spent seven months in China with him last year. He's presenting at it. Uh, uh, Fuzz Khan in high jump, uh, Nick Garcia, who is, uh, we haven't even talked about Nick. Nick is one is also one of these guys that does Bonner truck and does it properly, except he does it with high school kids because he's a full-time high school throws coach in Southern California, which is incredible to me, but Nick really gets the system and does it very, very well. Uh, has his own version of it, but still, he he totally gets it. So we're all presenting together, um, and so that's there as well. And you know what? Let's say this. Let's uh, let's say that um, anybody that's watching this for the next, I'll say for the next two weeks, anybody that wants to take the course mentions your name to me in an email evil track e-v-e-l-t-r-a-k at me.com i'll give them a 10 percent discount on the on the initial course price and it's the course is in canadian dollars it's 299 canadian so it's i think it's about fuck, it's like 200 bucks Canadian american i'll give you a 10 percent discount but you just got to email me first to get the code i'll send you a code you'll get a 10 percent discount okay awesome. and that will go for the next two weeks Awesome. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. What, what is two weeks from now? So let's say, let's say Friday, the, uh, Friday, the Friday, the 21st okay, cool. of September, 2018. Awesome. man, Derek, can't thank you enough for that, dude. That's, that's stellar. So get on that folks. Cause this, I'm jumping in it this weekend. Going to get diving through all that. Derek, this is fantastic. I think can't thank you enough for being on with us today, man. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, I, I really enjoy it. And, I, you know, I really enjoy connecting with you because uh, we've had some good conversations. So let's well, keep it up. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. We'll be in touch real soon, buddy. Thank you so much. All right, bro. Yep. And a huge thanks to Derek Evely for spending the time with us today. Guys, open, honest, candid sharing from one of the best coaches in the world in athletics, sharing with us who, you know, the commonalities from the people that have impacted him and the things that he's learned from. This is absolutely killer. And I can't thank Derek enough. And I also can't thank Derek enough for putting all that work together to putting together such a sensational resource in that, co in that course that he's got that he and Anatoly put together. Make sure you run over right now to eveltraksport.com. That's eveltraksport.com, eveltraksport.com. You can click the link in the notes or you can just type that in right now and check it out. Make sure you email him. And you get that 10% discount because, guys, this, this is some sensational stuff. I can't recommend it enough. Uh, I hope you guys take advantage of just such a sensational deal that he's offered for all of us. 
And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, guys, we are just trying to put the best information out there to all the great coaches that we possibly can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.